Welcome back to Educator.com. This is the second set of lessons on the nervous system, specifically the brain. The adult brain is composed of a hundred billion neurons, which is amazing to think about. That's a lot of cells. In the first few years of life, you actually lose a lot of brain cells. Think of it this way. Uh, a baby, their brain is like a giant untamed bush. And you don't need all of those little leaves and all of those little branches to have the bush, you know, look nice and serve a purpose. So imagine that the baby brain undergoes a lot of pruning. You kind of clip certain parts off that aren't necessarily needed, and it becomes this nice functional shape with compartmentalized parts. So actually, uh, proportionally, baby brains have a lot more neurons than they need. And by the time you get into your adult life, you're not really making uh, hardly any neurons anymore. The ones you have are the ones you're going to use until the end of your life. The brain is a part of the central nervous system, and we're going to abbreviate that in the future as the CNS. And the central nervous system, unlike the peripheral nervous system, contains the brain and spinal cord. It's literally central. Brain, spinal cord, going down your back in the middle. In addition to just your neurons that make up a lot of your brain, you're also going to have what are called neuroglia. And these are specialized kinds of neurons that don't do just the regular signaling, that they don't just do the sensory and motor part of how the CNS works with your body. The first one is oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes came up in the previous set of lessons regarding how neurons work. So if you remember Schwann cells being those myelin sheaths wrapping around neurons in your peripheral nervous system that branch off from your spinal cord and brain, Oligodendrocytes, they make those wrappings inside of the central nervous system. So they help insulate and make saltatory conduction possible in the brain. Astrocytes, uh, they maintain the blood-brain barrier. They have a lot of functions, but I find this the most intriguing, that astrocytes, which kind of look like little stars, um, that's why they're called astrocytes. Looks like there's like little kind of beams extending from their little cell body, astrocytes maintain the blood-brain barrier. And interestingly enough, your bloodstream, not everything in there is able to go into your brain. It's a protective mechanism, which is very important. And actually, um, some drugs introduced into the bloodstream, they stay out of the brain. Uh, and they affect other organs, other nerves outside of the central nervous system. And then other things can pass through. One of the many other functions of your blood-brain barrier is protecting your brain from certain microbes, certain parasitic worms. And interestingly enough, there is actually a kind of parasitic worm I've heard of that has evolved the ability to dissolve the blood-brain barrier. So it actually does end up inside a person's brain if it gets into their body. <laughs> Um, microglia is another kind of neuroglia, and think of microglia as like the the trash men, the the the, the trash compactors of the brain. They're kind of like a, a macrophage would be in your bloodstream, a, a, an eater of cell debris. So they go around doing what's called phagocytosis, where they grab stuff outside of the cell, uh, outside of themselves, like. Let's say it's uh, it's waste that's accumulated. Um, it might be some kind of foreign invader that got in there and it shouldn't be there. So they're cleaning up the trash in your central nervous system. And finally, the ependymal cells, you're going to find these more often around the ventricles, which are the little hollow cavities. You'll see more about those in the future on this presentation. Uh, they're like little holes, little cavities inside the brain. And the central canal, another cavity that you're going to find in the spinal cord, you would find these cells adjacent to those spaces, deep within the central nervous system, because they help produce what's called cerebrospinal fluid. And they help regulate it and kind of monitor it in case something goes wrong. And they, and they do help uh, produce more of it if it's needed or produce less of it if there's already plenty. When it comes to brain development, uh, you start small. If you look inside of a, of a tiny little uh, embryo, on a microscopic level, you have what's called a neural tube that first develops. And it's just very simple sets of neurons that are lined up, and there's a hollow uh, section in the middle. So it is like a tube. That tube ends up getting little 
pockets. You can call them brain vesicles if you want. So at three weeks, let me actually color code this for you, you would see three main sections. And up here, this is the anterior part towards the front. And back here is going to be the posterior part. Up at the anterior part, you would call this first bump the prosencephalon. Prosencephalon. And this word cephalon is going to be the suffix, the ending of all of these little areas. So prosen, pro meaning before, like prologue, is up at the front. The next part I'm going to do in green is actually going to be called the mesencephalon. And just for the sake of time and making it simpler, I'm just going to write mesen. It has cephalon after it, of course. And then finally, at the back end, the posterior part, this is the rhombencephalon. And that's at three weeks. Uh, usually before a woman even knows she's pregnant, this has already happened. Prosencephalon, mesencephalon, rhombencephalon. At six weeks, it gets a little bit more developed and expanded. So I'm going to still use black for what happens to this anterior vesicle. It actually becomes two areas. It grows into what's called the diencephalon and telencephalon. Diencephalon and the telencephalon. Next up, you're going to see the telencephalon actually gets to be more like a T. It actually will expand on the sides here. And if you use your imagination, kind of tilt your head to the side, if this expands horizontally, you can see how it looks like the top of a T. That's how I remember it. The middle part, called the mesencephalon, just stays the mesencephalon. And actually, the mesencephalon is a part of the adult brain. So this is not going to take on a different name as we go to um, the parts of this um, uh, brain tube, if you want to call it that, up until birth. The rhombencephalon does become uh, a couple of other areas, and there's a trick to remembering these areas. This is the metencephalon, and this is the myencephalon. The way that I remember the back end of this is it's alphabetical. Mes n with an s, met n t comes after s, and then myen, so s t, and then doesn't even go to e, it goes m y. So these are in alphabetical order. That's how I remember them from the middle part to the posterior portion. And then we're going to jump ahead way further than at six weeks. We're going to jump to forty weeks, which is the approximate amount of time that it takes uh, for a baby to develop and then be born. You're going to see some names that you probably have seen before, having to do with brain anatomy. So, the front gets a lot bigger. Um, I'm not even doing it justice how big this gets. The telencephalon becomes the entire cerebrum. The cerebrum in an adult brain, or a newborn baby brain, is that recognizable part with all the wrinkles on the surface. That's a lot of brain tissue. So this becomes what's called the cerebrum. This is still the diencephalon, and later on in this presentation, you'll see the diencephalon is just deep to what's going on in the cerebrum. The mesencephalon stays the mesencephalon. That's like an area between the diencephalon and the brain stem. So this is still the mesen. The metencephalon becomes two parts that are kind of in the... Um, inferior slash posterior parts of the brain. This becomes the pons, you'll hear about that more later, and the cerebellum. Cerebellum actually means uh, mini or little brain in Latin, because it's kind of a, a modified version of the word cerebrum. And then last, we're still using blue, this last part here becomes the medulla oblongata, which is a major portion of the brain stem, leading to your spinal cord. So by the time a baby is born, a lot has come of this initial simple 
uh, neural tube. Uh, these brain vesicles become well-established and enhanced as time goes on.